Otto had helped Heidegger find himself a job as an associate professor of philosophy. Heidegger never took to Marburg, however, and whenever he could, he made his way back to the Black Forest. His destination was a simple wooden hut he'd had specially constructed for himself on the slopes of a mountain called Totnerberg. This was to be his spiritual home for the rest of his life, somewhere he could always find the solitude he needed for his work. The family spent time here as well, though, and it's a place to which Heidegger's younger son, Hermann, remains deeply attached. So, here is also unser Wohnzimmer. Da hinten ist die Küche, wo meine Mutter gekocht hat. Da hinten haben wir noch ein Bett. Wir haben alle Weihnachten hier oben gefeiert. Sind mit Rucksack und Skiern hier angekommen und haben hier das Weihnachtsfest gefeiert. So, jetzt zeige ich Ihnen noch das Studierzimmer. Das ist also das Studierzimmer, wo mein Vater viele Sachen geschrieben hat. Er konnte hier oben am besten arbeiten. Und dann saß er hier an dem Tisch und schaut auf den Stüben Vasen raus, auf den Brunnen. Der hat für meinen Vater eine besondere Bedeutnis. Wenn Sie heute hier auf der Hütte sind, Herr Heidegger, erinnert Sie das sehr an Ihren Vater? Ja, natürlich. Er lebt hier für mich noch. Und äh, auch ich gehe sehr gerne hier rauf. Und wenn ich selber eine besonders schwierige Arbeit zu machen habe, sitze ich manchmal auch hier an diesem Schreibtisch und arbeite hier, weil das hier besonders gut geht. Totnerberg had a profound effect on Heidegger's personality. His long stays there appear to have reinforced his sense of himself as a true son of the Black Forest. And before long, he'd begun to cultivate a somewhat eccentric, rustic image. Heidegger's physique early on was a kind of invention of self. The insistence on peasant style clothes, the Black Forest way of speaking, chopping his own wood, his lonely hut high up in the hills at Dotnaberg. Nothing, I think, would have alerted one to the immensity of the work and of the thought. Hans Jorge Gadamer is one of the few people outside the philosopher's immediate family to have visited him at the hut. He vividly recalls Heidegger's curious manner and appearance, but he also remembers something else. He saw me as a bit like a, na ja, so halber und halber Monteur oder sowas aus Handwerker oder sowas. Aber die Augen, da sah ich, da war Fantasie in einem ganz anderen Grade. Als sie etwa bei Husserl oder den anderen großen Namen Natop, die ich so kannte. During the early 1920s, having broken decisively with the Catholic Church, Heidegger also began to distance himself from his mentor Edmund Husserl. Whereas Husserl was intent on illuminating the innermost workings of the mind, Heidegger became convinced that what thinkers like himself should really be addressing was the ordinary person's everyday experience of the world. This conviction led him to write what is generally regarded as his masterpiece, the dense, evocative, strangely worded text known as Sein und Zeit, or to use its English title, Being and Time. This work is a tour de force of philosophical writing. One can't help in reading it to be simply amazed and astounded. It also, viewed historically, was the moment in which phenomenology, that which hitherto had been the dominant philosophical uh, mode of thinking, was called into question, but called into question in such a radical way that it became almost impossible to go back to phenomenology and continue with it. At the heart of being and time, 
and therefore of Heidegger's philosophy as a whole, is one deceptively simple question. What is really meant by the verb to be? We all think we understand what we mean when we say that someone or something is, but do we? Or are we, as Heidegger thought, letting the familiarity of the word itself blind us to what is really the greatest mystery of all? Do we, in our time, have an answer to the question of what we really mean by the word being? Not at all. But are we nowadays even perplexed at our inability to understand the expression being? Not at all. Our aim in the following treatise is to work out the question of the meaning of being and to do so concretely. Our provisional aim is the interpretation of time as the possible horizon for any understanding whatsoever of being. Immanuel Kant, a no small figure he, had said that space and time were equally important. They were the way we organized our world. The very young Heidegger never forget he's writing this as a very, very young man, says not at all. Uh, space is an almost insignificant category. Time is a mystery. Time and human existence are inextricably linked, according to Heidegger. Our being, he says, is really a process of becoming. And this key insight leads him to reject the idea that there is such a thing as a fixed human essence. Heidegger's major contribution in Being in Time is to show how the old Aristotelian essence of man as the rational animal is, in effect, an abstraction. Because what comes first is man's own existence. And existence for Heidegger is nothing but this, this stretching whereby we are constantly projecting ourselves into a future, always expecting things, always hoping things. Heidegger is a man who first wanted to investigate how practical action shows that we're pulled ahead of ourselves into purposes that we're trying to fulfill, into tasks that we're working on. Think of a farmer in the Black Forest, for example, making a barrel. This is someone who has a future task that he's trying to fulfill, and he has a logic operating there that shows that the human being is actually extended ahead of himself. The ahead is where we really live, what we desire to do, what we anticipate, what we want this wood to turn out to be. People who live and work in traditional rural communities have an instinctive grasp of their own humanity, according to Heidegger. They are fully absorbed in and connected to the world. But they are also a clear minority of the human race. Heidegger argues that most of us, especially those who live in big modern cities, tend to lose touch with our individuality. Forced to conform to patterns of mass behavior, we experience strong feelings of anxiety, he says, and end up leading what he calls inauthentic lives. Most of us live what he called a life of one. One is one. One does this. One thinks that. Uh, one moves in this way. And he's saying to you, no, the I is not one. And this was in the 1920s sheer breathtaking prophecy before the great mass market detergents of standardized life and death which has swept over us. The the consumerism even of our deaths. They don't belong to us anymore. And he gave the great warning. He said, as this soap powder spreads over the planet, over the universe, it will be almost impossible for you to be you and not just one. Being and time was to make Heidegger's name